Hang Up and Listen is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? A smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save more than $700 on average. And customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need the most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you'll owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster, all so you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. The following podcast includes explicit language, including, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Hi, I'm Stefan Fatsis, and this is Slate's Sports Podcast. Hang up and listen for the week of October 17th, 2022. On this week's show, Slate's senior writer and college football expert, Ben Mathis Lilly, joins us to discuss the fall of Alabama, the sheer dominance of Michigan, and other developments on one of the craziest weekends of college football in recent memory. New Yorker staff writer Vincent Cunningham will be here to talk about a couple of new documentaries. First, the new HBO film, 38 at the Garden, about Jeremy Lin, the point guard who defied stereotypes, and for two months in 2012, took over New York and the NBA. We're thrilled to have ESPN's Pablo Torre come aboard for that conversation. And then we'll review the Redeem team from Netflix about the 2008 U.S. men's Olympic basketball team. I'm the author of A Few Seconds of Panic, Word Freak, and Wild and Outside. Josh Levine is off this week, but if you need your fix of Josh in your ears, and you do, and you haven't listened to the latest season of One Year about various happenings in 1986, you should do that. I'm in Washington, D.C. Joining me from Palo Alto, California, it's Joel Anderson, the host of Slow Burns Season 3 and 6, and most recently, a fantastic episode of One Year, 1986, about Indianola, Mississippi. What's up, Joel? Yo, what's up, Stefan? Good to see you. There's also going to be, if you if you got a hankering for some Josh, and even me, there's going to be another one year season coming up here. I don't want, I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about it, but uh it'll you know, you'll you'll be satiated through the end of the year if you're a fan of one year. Awesome. All right, before we get started, I have a special announcement for everyone today. For a limited time, you can get six months of Slate Plus for just $29. So that's 50% off. As a member, you get no ads on any of our podcasts, unlimited reading on the Slate site, and member-exclusive episodes and segments from Hang Up and Listen and other shows like One Year Slow Burn and The Political Gab Fest. Slate's podcasts cover major news events from elections to social issues to historic court decisions. Our shows also discuss what makes a song a smash, analyze what's going viral, and decode cultural mysteries. If we've become a part of your listening routine, we ask that you support our work by joining Slate Plus. 
If you do that, you can listen to this week's Slate Plus segment, in which we will continue our conversation with ESPN's Pablo Torre, who wrote back-to-back Sports Illustrated cover stories about Jeremy Lin back when Lin's sanity was going down. So sign up for Slate Plus now at slate.com slash hangupplus to access all of Slate's content and support our work. Again, that's just $29 for six months through October 28th. Sign up now at slate.com slash hangup. From 40, on the way, a knuckleball. He got it! And here they come. So what kind of weekend was it in college football? Here's a tweet from the official University of Tennessee football Twitter account on Sunday morning, the day after its cathartic overtime victory over third-ranked Alabama. At Vol underscore football. Y'all remember how we tore the goalposts down, hauled them out of Nayland, and dumped them in the Tennessee River? Yeah, that was awesome. Anywho, turns out that in order to play next week's game, we need goalposts on our field. Could y'all help us out? And they have a praise hands emoji. At last look, uh, Tennessee's new goalpost fund had raised $81,627 from 2,123 donors. And if any of our listeners are interested, God, I hope you're not, you can donate $16, as in 16 years since Tennessee's last win over Alabama, to as much as $1,019.15, which represents the capacity of their sold-out stadium, 101915 But... There were at least four other field stormings that I saw on TV Saturday from Fort Worth, where my 13th ranked TCU Horned Frogs defeated number eight Oklahoma State in overtime to later that night in Salt Lake City, where Utah knocked off undefeated USC in a one point victory. One game where there was none of that postgame drama was in Ann Arbor, where Michigan dispensed with all of it in a 41 to 17 ass kicking of previously undefeated Penn State, which brings us to our guest today. Ben Mathis Lilly, a Slate senior staff writer and author of The Hot Seat, a year of outrage, pride, and occasional games of college football. Ben, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. We're going to talk a little bit about that Bama-Tennessee game in a bit, but Ben, as many of you know, has the good fortune this fall of being a big Michigan football fan. And Though you were denied a wild finish in Ann Arbor, Ben, how did you feel seeing your team thoroughly dominate a top 10 team on Saturday? Well, you know what? You know, you're talking about field stormings. And and of course, Michigan fans didn't storm the field against Penn State because we're acting like we've been there before because we've been there for about what? Uh, nine months, <laughs> you know, so we're, uh, you know, we're, we're used to it by now, this, uh, this top five status. Um, no, I, I'm feeling good. I, I started the season thinking um, it would be possible to beat Ohio State. Then I, I convinced myself that it would not be. And now I'm convincing myself again that it, that it will be possible after this weekend. So I'm, I'm, I'm riding the roller coaster and I'm on, the, I'm on top right now. I'm very excited for you, Ben, and for Michigan. You know, I've got relatives in Michigan. I grew up a Michigan fan, too. Um, not in the same way. But can we just back up for a second? Tennessee wants people to give money to put up <laughs> new fucking goalposts. Yeah. How much do their boosters generate every year? Uh, this is an SEC school. Like, seriously, they're hitting people up for 16 bucks? Come on. I, is that supposed to make you feel good? Like you're part of the program if you contribute for the goalpost fund? This got to be a joke, right? Like Somebody that's a Tennessee fan, let us know. Because I imagine Tennessee's got to be top 20 in revenue among FBS programs in the country, right? Like it's, it's Like it's one of the largest... Schools of the country, so surely they're not passing around a collection plate for real. I think they should get them out of the river. I think that like <laughs> makes the. I mean, imagine then you know the next for the next forty years, your good people going in the stadium and point at the copas. Those are you know those were the ones you know. The bottom of this web page appears to be from the University of Tennessee's Office of Annual Giving. So this is like the Republican Party and the Democrats too, like sending <laughs> out fundraising announcements after, yeah, you know, events. Yeah, there's no way that that money, I, I'm sorry, like, I mean, maybe I, I don't want to accuse them of any nefarious, uh, anything nefarious, but I can't imagine that money is really going to those goalposts. It, I, I assume 
they'll have it back up in time. But you never know. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You know, maybe they maybe Josh Heupel really cost that much money. Who knows? I don't know how it goes. But, you know, Ben and I are friends. We go back a ways, uh, hang up at listeners. And, uh, and one thing that we've talked about over the years is, man, I believe that they should have never, they should never get rid of Jim Harbaugh, that he is as good of a coach in football, period, as there's going. And there was a lot of angst around Michigan over the years about, oh man, they're not as good as Ohio State. And it's never been able to get over that hump. So where is the Michigan faithful now after all of it? After like, it seems like Michigan's shaping up into being something real, right? Yeah, I think that there's a um, a significant contingent, myself included, who are 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 just get more and more embarrassed every week that we were ready to like move on uh, from Harbaugh in the 2020 season. Like, and as we get further and further from that pandemic season, it just seems weird in a lot of ways. Uh, jo- Josh Heupel, the head coach of Tennessee, you bring him up. Uh, he went six and four in 2020 pandemic year, actually. And so when Tennessee hired him, a lot of people, myself included, were like, "What? Let's that that's who you're going to go with," you know. Um, and Jim Harbaugh went two and four that year. So it, it turns out that maybe that, that, you know, playing under a completely bizarre set of disrupted circumstances did actually affect teams. Uh, and then that, that wasn't the season to draw conclusions from. Uh, but yeah, Harbaugh has him in the right direction. And I think that the, you know, to, to tie it back to what I said earlier, like the thing that, uh, that is especially promising about, about Michigan is that they ran the ball for 418 yards against Penn State. Uh, Ohio State does not seem to have a better defense than Penn State does. So, you know, you could actually go through the season and think to yourself, maybe we'll be competitive uh, in the last game. Maybe we have, you know, an outside shot of, of beating Ohio State, which they, they hadn't for like, you know, 15, 20 years, kind of the same situation as Tennessee was with in with Alabama. So more so than than the program, you know, occasionally being ranked in the top five or whatever, I think it's really getting that uh, the, you know, back to where they're like a real thorn in the side of Ohio State fans and Ohio State coaches. Like you can tell, like it, it bothers them again, you know, that Michigan is good. And I think that's probably his greatest achievement. And what's really changed there, Ben? I mean, they were obviously really good last year, made the playoff, got embarrassed in the semifinals, but that didn't matter because they made the playoff and more important, they beat Ohio State. But this team looks better is what you're saying and other people are saying. I mean, is the reason that they've sort of resolved the sort of fake quarterback controversy? Is it that the some parts of this team are better than they were last year? Has it been the opposition? I mean, do you think this is a... I mean, not to put any put you under any uh, any pressure here, but you know, is this a back to back over Ohio State, and this time they will do better in the uh, in the playoff? Um, I think that they're more equipped to do better in the playoff. I'm not sure they'll beat Ohio State. I mean, the thing about Ohio State for those who don't follow college football in and out week to week, uh, according to the advanced numbers right now, Ohio State has the best college offense in the history of civilization. <laughs> it's like the best <laughs> offense in any sport that's ever been played by people. <laughs> so as confident as I am and, and as pleased as I am with the progress, like it's certainly far from, I think Michigan will be a touchdown, you know, underdog in, in Ohio, at Ohio State, no matter what happens. Uh, so I'm not even going to, I'm not going to make that what I, what I tie my entire uh, opinion of the season on because they're, they're, they're pretty good too. But I mean, I think that's the kind of the funny thing about what Jim, Har- Jim Harbaugh did is that he came into the program saying like, we're just going to be tough, you know, like the the classic football coach thing, like we're going to have tough lines. We're going to have tough offensive line, a tough defensive line. And that's how we're going to get, you know, ahead of these five-star athletes, wide receivers, you know, quarter, all world quarterbacks that Ohio State has. And that kind of doesn't even sound like that great an idea when you're saying it out loud. And, you know, by 2020, it really didn't sound like a good idea, you know, five straight losses um, to OSU. Uh, but he, he just kind of kept doing it, um, and, you know, continued to, you know, have it build, try to build a team that can run the ball against anybody. Um, and, and as you allude to, like, they do have like a pretty good, you know, if maybe still a little green, but, uh, a a quarterback who can run himself and has like kind of a rocket arm, like could finally have like a central casting quarterback. So yeah, maybe that is the... What, what what takes them over the next level. But yeah, that's kind of, I mean, he, you know, they added some stuff on offense, like they'll, they'll do kind of the newfangled screen game and RPOs and stuff like that. So there's some, some stuff around the edges, but it really did come back to like, just a guy saying we're going to be tougher than the other guys. And after a while, like it actually turned out to be true. It's hard to have a weekend in college football where three top eight teams lose by one score and conversation not turned to the end of the season, right, where there's playoffs. And I thought one of the funny things that happened as I was looking after Bama lost to Tennessee is that people were like, well, man, maybe the SEC needs to go ahead and get three teams in the playoff. 
And I'm just kind of wondering, like, uh, from Big Ten land, where Ohio State seems pretty good, you know, maybe number one good. Michigan seems pretty good. You know, it should be up there. And they will get to play each other, so one of those teams will take a loss. But, like, that must seem absurd to hear, you know, Bama loses a game, not looked good in about three or four games this year, and then people be looking for some sort of way for them to backdoor their way uh, into the playoff. Is that uh, sort of the sentiment among the Michigan and Ohio and Big Ten fans going on right now? Oh, oh yeah, I'm certainly offended by that personally. Although, as Stefan said, Michigan's uh, loss to Georgia last year means that they probably don't deserve the benefit of the doubt until they go out there and play on an equal footing with an SEC team. The SEC team. But I, that's kind of what I was thinking when I, you know, when when Bama went down, and, and as you said, they looked kind of, you know, vulnerable against Texas, uh, and in a couple other games, Georgia almost lost to Missouri. Um, it, this may be the kind of thing we say every year, but it seems like in the middle of the season, like we might have a four-team playoff between four teams who everyone kind of thinks could win, and that's exciting, rather than, you know, one or one or two, or two at most, you know, as it is in some years. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's cool, and I don't know, I don't have a larger structural explanation for it besides that, like, it's hard to do what Nick Saban does forever, um, you know, uh, and it's hard for Ohio State to dominate Michigan forever. Uh, but it does, it is kind of exciting to see like, hey, we might have Tennessee in there. We might have, we might have Michigan in there, Ohio State, you know, it could be the first non-SEC team, non-Southern team, uh, excuse me, to win in a long time. So yeah, I think it's shaping up, um, you know, kind of uh, to, to everyone's surprise uh, as a really wide open season after, after we kind of all went in the year thinking that, you know, it's going to be Georgia or Bama again. Oh, maybe they'll expand the playoff. That's a big idea. What do you think? Maybe they'll do that. Yeah, Um, they are doing that. The other thing I noticed about this week, and I was not watching these games like you guys were on Saturday because I was losing six games in a row at a Scrabble tournament. Oh. I recovered a little bit, oh, but man. yeah, it was pretty bad. Stefan's still top ranked, though. Still, you know, one of the best oh, in the country. Yeah. So, you know, you can lose you, with a very, like, very generous definition of top, I'm still. Bama top-ranked. lost, you can lose. You know what I mean? It's a, that doesn't exactly, mean it doesn't yeah. really <laughs> do much to hurt your reputation. We've predicted Nick Saban and Stefan's downfall too many times <laughs> right. to. Uh, so back to the football, because I could talk all day about, like, playing. I played Kloopied, C-L-U-P-E-I-D. Wow. I made some nice plays. Um, had some good games. Beat the number one seed in the tournament. Wow. Um, awesome. I noticed that, I mean, the other thing about this weekend that made it super crazy was that these games were all ridiculously high scoring. Mm-hmm. Um, 51-49, yep. the Utah USC, Utah USC upset was also super high scoring. I mean, Michigan put up 40-plus. Um, Tennessee, Alabama... What was the third one that was outrageous? Um, well, it was T- yeah, TCO Oklahoma TCO, State. TCO Oklahoma State was 45-42, was it? Yeah. Um, I mean, do you guys have any sense of, of, of reasoning for this? Is it just, you know, random fluky season where these offenses are throwing up a lot of points and defenses are weak? Or are we seeing some sort of strategic you know, reckoning in college football? I think it's strategic reckoning and also just the quality of the quarterbacks, mm-hmm. which is tied in with the strategic reckoning. So, like, one thing that people have noticed, people who follow the, the sport even more closely than me, is, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you had quarterbacks like Tim Tebow, Denard Robinson, who were really exciting to watch in, in college, but they were limited as, as quarterbacks, as passers. Uh, and you could get away with that. You could win national championships, as as uh, Florida did, as, as Urban Meyer did, uh, with a quarterback who, who was not, you know, going to be throwing the ball in the NFL. And defenses figured out what to do about that. They stopped, like, the, they figured out that you, how you put more people in the box and you stop the, you stop the run first. I mean, you know, it's probably more complicated than that, but maybe not really. Uh, and so, you know, quarterbacks adapted, you know, the evolution continues. And so now you have this generation of quarterbacks, which is guys like, like I was just watching the Utah uh, USC highlights myself, you know, Caleb Williams and Cam Rising are both just, they're, they're running the ball, they're throwing it. Uh, Hendon Hooker's not like as, you know, as run first as some other people, but he's able to like move when he has to. And same with Bryce Young, same with J.J. McCarthy of Michigan. So you have all these quarterbacks who just cannot, really can't be stopped. I mean, you felt sorry for second, I felt sorry for all the defensive secondaries this weekend because it's like if you go back too far, like the quarterback's just going to run it for 11 yards. Uh, and if you stay up, he's going to, bomb at 25 yards to 35 yards down the middle and find a guy in the middle of the zone. And it just seemed like no one had an answer. Uh, no one anywhere in the sport had an answer. And I think that that goes back to just the, the quality of the quarterbacking. I even think about it like this, you know, and I did not expect to bring this game up today, but I'm just going to go ahead that 
o- Oklahoma, for instance, scored 52 points in its win over Kansas, right? And the week before, they lost 49 to nothing to Texas and looked, I mean, I mean, they were playing a third stringer from... You going to walk back anything, Joel, on, on, on your Oklahoma hate over the last six weeks? Uh Oh, they beat Kansas. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, it doesn't affect I mean, they beat Kansas back. at home. Kansas. I mean, they beat Kansas at home. I mean, Barry Switzer would be embarrassed that this is like a meaningful <laughs> victory for them. But, um, I mean, Dylan Gabriel was out for that game against Texas, and he comes back in, and all of a sudden, that offense looks competent. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely quarterbacks, but also scheming. Like, for instance, TCU, uh, Max Dugan has been the starting quarterback at TCU for four years now. The first three, I wanted him replaced. I mean, like every every week, I was praying that somebody would would just show up uh, and and displace him, including Chad Morris's son, uh, Chandler Morris, who who played pretty well last year in an upset of Baylor. But this year, Sonny Dykes is there, and yes, I'm going to give Sonny Dykes some props. But uh, Sonny Dykes showed up, and all of a sudden, Max Dugan looks like much more than a competent quarterback. And it seems like TCU has an offense that can play like that. It's just, it's really hard to defense your way to a championship anymore with the exception of Georgia's team last year, which was like generationally great. Like that defense was generationally great in the way that Joe Burrow's LSU offense was generationally great. So um, yeah, I mean, you've got to have some competence and be able to scheme it up. And like, that's what, it's just, you know, would I, have, I don't know if you have this sensation of watching football with like older people or people that don't watch football and they're like, wait a minute, tackling is really bad in football now. Oh, yeah, tackling. <laughs> so they, they don't teach tackling anymore because it's, you know, there's no hit in practice. But like, man, they put people in space now and it's really hard <laughs> to, 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 to round up a six foot, 200 pound wide receiver who runs a four or five if they're in space. Like, that's just. Football is just played differently now. And so that's what I think. The result is that we get all these games in the 40s and 50s, which is, I think, good for college football, right? Like, it's exciting. I mean, maybe maybe some of us fetishize the 10 to 7 days of yore, but not me. I'm not one of those guys. Now, there's the overtime factor, too. Fair point. Fair point. Fair point. Jacks up the scores. But and my score check, by the way, TCU was 43-40 over Oklahoma State, and the USC over, I'm sorry, Utah over USC was 43-42. Okay, see. Just want to make sure we had those right. Okay, there you go. I mean, give us our, give us our props. But yeah, man, TCU looks. I mean, we don't look Michigan great, but you know, I have I have a lot more. You know, speaking of people who were against, were sort of torn on their like coaching hire, and I was like, I don't know about Sonny Dykes, man. I don't know, you know. But at least so far, he seems pretty good. But nothing, nothing on the level of Michigan. Like I just, I, you know, <laughs> I'm so I'm so glad. If it actually, you know, I was thinking because, you know, this weekend, as BML knows, uh, Michigan celebrated the 25th anniversary of that 1997 championship team at Michigan. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, man, it's so good to have Michigan and Tennessee be good again. Like, I don't know what it is about those yes. programs being good, but like, it just feels like college football is different and better when those two schools are really good, right? That's kind of the thought I had when I was, I watched, you know, I, I kind of kept track of the Alabama Tennessee game and I really actually watched the end, like when it was close. And like, I have to give props to Tennessee for their for their production design, <laughs> for like their art direction. Like that's that looked incredible when the fireworks oh, went dude, off. Yeah, the on the overhead shot. And everything. Like, yeah. That, yeah, orange is a great color. Uh, you know, the orange and white looks great. Uh, like the the vol sign on the mm-hmm. top of the stadium. Like it's cool. Yeah, and that's kind of what I mean when I'm talking about like anyone could win this year. It's not just that like uh, you know for the. The abstract sake of parody, you know, I, you know, it would be nice not to have Bama win again. But like, these are just fun. Like that, like as everyone had said, as Alex Kirshner wrote in Slate, which is in a great piece. Like, that's why college football is fun. Like, look at all like the hundred thousand people in Orange. Like, I love seeing TCU Stadium full. Uh, the Utah crowd was crazy. Uh, even you know they're a four and two team. They still like it was a crazy atmosphere uh, out there on 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 Saturday night. Uh, and it's just like it just it's not just that like the sport needs it for its business you know for to keep its business afloat or, or to keep people interested in the TV ratings up. But like it's just it's just fun to have these these teams be relevant. Chuck Culpepper had a, a th- I thought a really nice wrap up of this in the Washington Post. Um, about the weekend. And the point he makes is that the one great thing in college football is that when an outlier event or the end of a long stretch of misery happens, it is not just cathartic, it is inspirational. It's fun. And the image of the Tennessee Stadium with the field also covered in orange after the game, after everyone stormed, is really cool. 
And, you know, being a Northerner who has not experienced SEC football or felt that way about college football, though my Penn Quakers, by the way, undefeated, 5-0. and Really? Okay, I back at it. Okay, yeah. go for the You know, seeing those images makes you realize that, yeah, at its best, you know, leaving aside all of the, the, the things we hate about football, at its best, college football is just so cool to watch, to see that, you know, to see the, the sort of collective joy in these college towns. Yeah, I mean, it's just um, people often ask, like, why we, you know, particularly Josh and I, like, why we love college football. And I think, uh, Ben, you're kind of in the same thing. There's nothing, there's just nothing like a fall Saturday when a game ends like that. Or what, just the, just being in the stadium of a big game, even if it doesn't turn out to be an epic like the games we saw this weekend. There's just nothing like being at a college football stadium and the enthusiasm there, no matter how good your NFL right, and, team and is. And more to the point of what happened, too, with Tennessee, Alabama, is that ending those streaks. Yeah. I mean, Chuck, in his piece in the Post, mentions Michigan beating Ohio State last year after going 2-17 and 17 in this century. Kansas in 2005, ending a 36-game losing streak to Nebraska. Kentucky in 2018, ending a 31-straight game losing streak to Florida. Even Temple in 2015, ending a 31-straight game losing streak to Penn State. Um, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, the, the thing I like loved about seeing the, the stadiums full at Tennessee and at, and at TC, which has had, you know, like a couple of off years, is just like it, – it, it's it's just like you it's a reminder that like you cannot quit this this sport mm-hmm. even if you even if you wish you could yeah. like that's it like Tennessee has been like went one like one in 29 against Florida and Bama over over you know, like uh, their two biggest rivals and there's still a hundred thousand people who are ready to get back in it the second it looks like they might have a chance you know and that's that's really the fantastic part and it can be the excruciating part of course too um but like that's the thing that you know that other sports may never be able to replicate. None of us will be able to get Saturday out of our blood, uh, including, but maybe Stefan will. I hope he can because it seems <laughs> like he's still reeling from his uh, Scrabble tournament. But no, no, I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. Well, look, we'll have been back. I'm probably certain around that Ohio State Michigan <laughs> week uh, at a minimum. So, Ben, thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing in your uh, momentary Michigan elation. All right. Thanks, guys. In the next segment, we're going to have ESPN's Pablo Torre on to talk about the latest documentary about Jeremy Lin. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you'll owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster, all so you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval. Interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. When Jeremy Lin was claimed off waivers by the New York Knicks in late December of 2011, his new teammates and Madison Square Garden security guards literally didn't believe the skinny, baby-faced, six-foot-three Asian-American guy was a player. In his first 22 games, Lin didn't do much to prove that he was, totaling just 42 mostly garbage-time minutes and 32 points. But New York was so banged up that before a home game against the Nets in early February, head coach Mike D'Antoni told Lynn he'd be getting minutes. Lynn's agent told him that after he'd already been cut by the Warriors and Rockets, this was probably his last chance in the NBA. Here's Lynn's former teammate, Amon Shumpert, in the new HBO original documentary, 38 at the Garden. 
when they subbed Jalen in, he was looking people dead in their eye. You talking about somebody that's coming from, I don't know if I'll be on the team tomorrow, but <laughs> for tonight, fuck you. Shumpert is one of a cast of smart and delightful talking heads in this alternately uplifting, entertaining, and profoundly serious short doc directed by Frank Chi. Another is ESPN's Pablo Torre, the host of the morning podcast ESPN Daily, and a regular on many other programs on the network. Pablo, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Uh, Shump is a high bar for me to clear now that you've introduced me with him. I was jealous of his sound bites for the record. Oh my God, he is awesome. And we'll <laughs> get into really that. Also with us for this and our next segment is New Yorker staff writer and theater critic, Hang Up and Listen Super Sub, and Nick's super fan, Vincent Cunningham. Hey, Vincent. So glad to be with you on this, the day of a really a day of celebration. Jeremy Lin is just like forever the birthday boy. So happy. <laughs> All right, Pablo, Lynn's fuck you that night against the Nets was 25 points in 36 minutes and the start of seven extraordinary weeks that became known as Lynn's sanity. But let's roll it back a few years. You were a senior at Harvard when Lynn was a freshman. Were you an instant fan of the Asian-American kid at the end of the Crimson Bench? I was. I was sight unseen, of course, because that is my ancestral uh, mandate is to support Asian athletes wherever they may emerge, however randomly. And so this kid, Jeremy Lin, who's a freshman, I mean, he was not really getting playing time, but he was significant enough that I wrote a quick sidebar for the school paper. Um, the title was Asians in the Outfield, in which he was the last name mentioned among Asian athletes at Harvard that needed to be publicized for the world to know. So yes, Stefan, absolutely. So Pablo, what point did you realize this guy's just not on the team, like he's somebody that we need to know that this is somebody that is good and could be like a program making sort of player? Yeah, so senior year, his senior year, he was like the only D1A player to lead, I think, his team in every major statistical category. He was really good and he was like dunking with two hands on UConn. He was like hitting a game winner against, you know, I'll, I'll trail off a little bit. William and Mary. Yeah, I get it. Um, but the point is, the point is, like, I was watching these games and the dude was fucking incredible. I and saw him beat the Quakers at the Palestra. That's right. Penn still. The Quakers still still quaking after that. No, but, but listen, man, um, the fact is he was legitimately good as an Ivy League player. He was somebody who was clearly special given Ivy League standards. And you look back in his history and this is why I pitched the story to SI his senior year, um, about just like why he was suddenly this thing. I mean, he was getting, it's important to remember this, he was getting fans from China, from Taiwan, visiting for like games against Dartmouth because this was, again, the level of scarcity for a guy who played and looked and sounded like him. Back then, obviously there was like a visibility issue, but were there already signs of the stuff that we would later see in the NBA of people sort of heckling him with racially inflected words and throwing those from the stands what was the what was the status of his specialness even back then in college yeah i mean he was getting it all i mean he was called a chink by someone in the ivy league he told me like on the floor um he was somebody who was getting chance sweet and sour pork mm. and all of that genre of just taunts on the road he was somebody who even when he was like applying to colleges like he wasn't getting recruited he got mistaken for other people all of the time he would send a he would send a mixtape out to like coaches assistants and no one gave a shit I, I mean this was very much uh, the story of his rise since he was a little kid through absolutely d1 basketball you know you talk in the in the documentary which i think is terrific and everybody should watch this and we'll talk about why some more um but in the doc we learned that you know and i knew this stuff but we learned that he and his dad had to cut their own highlight reel. He was completely unrecruited, even though he was the California D2 State Player of the Year and led his team to the state championship. Yes. Um, we learned that the only reason that the Warriors signed him out of Harvard is because the new owner of the team, his kid, played against Lynn in high school. And we also learned that this would have been unusual under any circumstances, his even getting that far right? Because he came from a traditional Asian family. His mother had him taking piano lessons. It was all about success. It was only because his father, it turns out, liked basketball and said, yeah, you can 
keep going with this thing um, when he was probably, what, in middle school or something. Yeah, Gi Ming, his dad, Gi Ming Lin, is, is this guy who would, like, go and shoot hook shots and, like, was just an NBA fan. And he was... I, I related to Jeremy immediately just because that's kind of like what my dad was, except my dad and my mom did not birth a six foot three athletic specimen who was routinely infantilized even though he's like legitimately six foot three and really fast and hitting like game winners on tape um but you're right i mean he came and this is why the story is so deeply relatable to like all of asian america still 10 years later it's because he did come in a very real sense from exactly the template that has been stereotyped and that has become familiar to many of us because guess what? We also happen to live that template very often. I was going to ask you something totally different, but I live in Palo Alto. I'm right down the street from, right. from Jeremy Lin's like the park he played at and right across the street from the high school that he went to. And I always tell, you know, my wife, we lived out here for seven years now. I was like, yo, the Bay Area is kind of like, Atlanta for Asian Americans. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like, you just go here, you, you, like, you run the culture out here. You know what I'm saying? That's an incredible scouting report, and I fully agree. Well, yeah, and so I was just like, do you think his story would have been possible anywhere else if he had grown up somewhere else? And, you know, it, it seems like you're, I can speak as a, as a black person in Atlanta. Like, you feel like, you feel, you feel like part of the crowd. You can blend in and you can be whatever you want to be. Do you think that some of that helped with his story out here? You know, it's a really it's a really good question. Um, I, I think that the milieu in which he grew up in, I mean, it's important to remember that because he's Asian American playing basketball, he very much still felt like the minority. Um, that's that's the kind of trick when it comes to like the demographics, which is a larger like tangled web that we can begin to untangle here. But the idea is even in Palo Alto, he would show up on the court and he would be he would be um, requested as anyone's sort of like preferred target. You know, like I want that guy or you're going to laugh at that guy. And so it's just telling to me, Joel, like even in Palo, <laughs> even in the Atlanta and I now want an epi- I want a series that's just Atlanta, but Asian in Palo Alto, uh, even there, he felt like, OK, I am very much still an underdog. You know, it, it's really interesting. You, you talk about that tangled web of sort of race and sports. And I kept on thinking about this during the the movie, which I really enjoyed, too. But I of, often thought that it like it sometimes it didn't specify who was saying these things, or like what direction whatever tensions he felt were coming from. I think part of that is the discomfort of like, it's basketball. Therefore, the majority you're talking about is black. You know, this, this like in America, we're very able to talk about racism when we can like identify a sort of like racist looking like boss white man who's like, but when it's like two groups that are not at the top of the sort of socioeconomic ladder, it gets really hard. And I, I just wonder whether you think we're ever going to be able to actually have that conversation. I'm ready for it. I mean, it, it, it was conspicuous to me, too. Look, I, I, I really enjoy the film. I did not produce the film. I like the guys who did. I was so glad to be a voice in the film that provided some guidance. But, you know, like the names, let's be honest, the names that I wanted to hear from or I would have interviewed to get to that deeply uncomfortable topic. It's yeah. like Carmelo Anthony, right? Yeah. J.R. Smith. And I would also throw in LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, these guys who who speaking of like that tradition that I just talked about with Joel of like, I want that guy. The heat game against the Knicks, like the reckoning of insanity. There's a reason and there are a number of reasons, again, in this tangled web, why LeBron and Dwayne Wade argued over whether they would be the one to guard Jeremy Lin, like full court. And I think part of it is because. OK, there's recognition. He has been hyped to a degree that none of us would have benefited from yeah. if we had exactly right. the same stats and exactly the same moments. And I've talked to Jeremy about this. He has said that he feels self-conscious and insecure at times about the degree of hype right. on that level. But it's also true at the same time that when Carmelo Anthony and J.R. Smith are kind of breaking locker room code by laughing and insulting the contract he ended up getting from the Rockets that took him away from New York, they're saying he got too much money. It's sort of like, OK, take it from the perspective of Jeremy. 
And it's like feeling again like this outsider who doesn't feel like he belongs anywhere. And that manifests, I think, in why we only hear from Iman Shumpert and Tyson Chandler as players, teammates of Jeremy Lin on that team. You know, we're not hearing from Mello. We're not hearing from J.R. Smith. And the reason was, and this has been written about, that they were resentful of the attention, as you alluded to, Vincent. Um, and it's not like Jeremy Lin wasn't conscious of this. He gave, a, a, I thought, a, a good interview to Sopandeb of the New York Times last week in which he talks about how it was troubling for him. Like, by the, he says, by the time that Linsanity came around and I got worldwide recognition, the only thing people really wanted to talk about was my ethnicity and my race, and oftentimes in very demeaning and condescending and just racist ways. It was like the thing where I was like, I just don't want you guys to talk about me being Asian. I just want you to appreciate what I'm doing on the court. I'm an artist and you're missing out on the art. And the question I would have is, did other players, did the LeBrons and D. Wades and Mellows miss out on what he was doing because they were minimizing it because of what he looked like? It was almost like their desire to minimize. And Kobe Bryant did this the most famously, right? I don't know who this kid is. As he was on every sort of screen and newspaper and magazine, I don't know who this kid is. It almost felt in the way that sports is maybe uniquely sort of set up to do. It almost felt like that minimizing was the compliment, though. You know, it's the idea that he's actually a threat. He's actually taking food in some metaphorical sense off of our table. He's actually getting what we want. And again, we ran an experiment for the first time ever in professional sports, really, in general. Like, what happens when this sort of a person is dropped into this ecosystem? And everybody has to reckon with, I don't really know what to do here. Paula, I want to put the spotlight on you for a second because you were in the documentary uh, and you said something that I thought was really interesting and I could sort of relate to it in different fields. You said, as an Asian kid, you spent your life identifying with people who look nothing like you. So I'm just sort of curious about like your journey into sports because you talked about the things that you had to face um, getting into the sports media business. What, like, what would have drawn you in given that sort of experience, right? Yeah, it, it was it was not something where there was like a welcome mat or a path or a roadmap or a structure that I could see myself fit into. And in the documentary um, and, in, and at numerous times, I, I've, I've sort of talked about like how people even still who don't watch ESPN just assume I'm like the tech guy when I'm like, I work for ESPN. And I'm trying to be like, you know, I'm not trying to say I'm a TV gas bag. They're like, oh, you probably work on like the website, like in, in, in the uh, in the tech IT end of things. Um and, and for me, you know, when I say that people still see themselves in Jeremy Lin, I mean that both in this poetic but also very literal sense. We just don't have, and especially like because sports is, is again this cauldron, this test for manhood, we just never see this character play this role. He never got cast in this way, right? I mean, Simu Liu, um, now a Marvel superhero, is now the answer to who would you cast if you were casting an Asian American superhero? But I remember asking Jeremy that question and the very depressing answer was that the answer, the closest answer was probably Jeremy Lin, who is not an actor, but is the <laughs> only one who has ever seemed anything like an alpha in, in, in culture. Which is which is sad and and responsible for a lot of just the more obvious um, elemental hormonal responses to why this thing still sort of excites people. Let's talk about the two big games um, after the Nets game. He goes out and scores 28 against Utah, 23 against Washington. And in that game, he crosses up John Wall and Tomahawk dunks. Hassan Minaj, the comedian who's great in the doc, says that at the time he made a video, and the video includes the line, you should not get dunked on someone who took calculus BC. Um, <laughs> and at that point, Lynn jerseys are selling out. Teammates are trying to figure out who this guy is. The whole league is trying to figure out this, who this guy is. And then, and then on February 10th, this is when Kobe and the Lakers come to the garden, and you describe it in the doc, Pablo, it's like, being at a big fight in Vegas, the hottest ticket in a dozen years. The Lakers had Kobe Powell, Meta World Peace. Kobe, before the game, said he has no idea who Jeremy Lin is. When he asked if he would have to guard him, he mutters Jesus Christ under his breath and kind of turns <laughs> away from the camera. You were at this game. What was the phenomenon like that night? And tell us, for those who don't remember or you know weren't old enough, 
um, or weren't there, what it felt like to be part of this extravaganza. Yeah, I feel like every time I begin to answer um, this question, like I have to apologize to my wife because I'm tempted to say this was the best night of my life, <laughs> which is again, just like a generally sad statement, but also very, very deeply felt because I have never seen or felt anything like that. Um, I remember being on the court with a friend from the New York Daily News at the time, and I was asking him, like, ah, everybody's here. Like, everyone's showing up. Like, it's a fight. It's a big mega fight. And he was like, yeah, I'm just here in case Jeremy scores 50. <laughs> and so even still, pregame, there was just like this wink and a nod, like, this is probably going to end here. And if you go back and look at, like, what was happening that season, I'm not saying that that version of Kobe and that version of the Lakers was the top of... They were not the top of the NBA ladder at that point. But if you were to, again, cast the movie... Who would you want to be playing them in the garden? Again, this is in the garden. He had just been in Washington. Now he's home for the first time during this run. That's the important part here. He had not been in the garden doing this until then. And so, you know, God, what was it that... Um, it is the only good quote I, I, I repeat from Kurt Schilling about mystique and aura being dancers at a nightclub, him talking about, Na about Yankee Stadium. <laughs> like, you felt some sense of, like, mystique and aura at Madison Square Garden, awakened by this kid who just revealed that he had a giant set of testicles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and it's so it's so interesting. What Spike Lee said was he did this, this series of tweets that were like, Jeremy, enter the dragon Lynn or something like that, right? And it's like, but it was funny because it's like he's comparing him to Bruce Lee, right? So at one, he's racializing him, but also like being like, this guy's a badass, right? And I think that's what's interesting that like who liked him and who didn't like him, it, either way, he was totally racialized. Right. And, and yeah, I'm, yeah. Well, the, uh, there is like a black exploitation kind of like, by the way, shared Asian, African American kind of crossover there. Which, on some level, I do kind of want that imaginary movie poster. By the way, yeah. <laughs> Full admission. But do you think though that that has made him, um, even now, right? He definitely understands what he has meant to people and what he continues to mean to people. Do you think that that will continue to be a burden for him to be like the great Asian hope or whatever? I think he realizes that this is like his station in life. Like this is kind of actually his calling. I mean, getting sort of shut out of the NBA in the way that he has been. Um, and I feel like he has deserved another shot somewhere and has not gotten it despite going to the G League, despite putting up numbers overseas. Um, I think he has realized that this is actually where he makes the most impact, where he means the most still. And, and for him, I want to remind everybody about this too like going back to that laker game going back to that run he was one of the worst quotes that i think i've ever just like encountered he was he was nervous he was kind of paranoid actually did not kind of outright paranoid um he was protected by the knicks in a way that did not do him i think didn't do him any favors but now he's this guy who sounds like he has been through therapy and he sort of like gained this zoomed out perspective on like why it is that his goal at one point coming up through basketball had been to un-Asian himself such that he would be regarded just on the level of like the art. And now he realizes that the thing that makes him special because of how much everybody else identifies with him, who is Asian American, he's realizing that I got to do the opposite right. because that's kind of what the universe has asked me to do. Pablo Torre, host of ESPN Daily Morning Podcast all over the ESPN airwaves as well. We're going to continue the conversation with him in our bonus segment for Slate Plus members. We'll talk about Jeremy Lin's Toronto game, which featured the wave off and what happened to Lin at the end of that season and more. So stick around for that. Pablo, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy, Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. 
Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need the most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why 4 out of 5 new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. The first scene of the Redeem Team, Netflix's new documentary on the 2008 U.S. Olympics men's basketball team, opens with Kobe Bryant and LeBron James talking about the buildup to the Beijing Games. Here's a clip. So you see like a guy it. with a Celtics jersey at Disneyland, I'm ready to kill him. Just because he's wearing a Garnett jersey, you know, I'm pissed. When he comes up to me, I'm thinking he's going to say something smart about the finals, right? Bring back the gold for us. Enough said. Enough said. Bring back the gold. It's a real redemption story, you know, for Kobe Bryant and the U.S. men's team. The story of both is inextricably linked as the U.S. Olympic teams of pros enter the 2008 Games, having been dethroned as the world's best collection of basketball players. Kobe is, in many ways, the missing piece, and the other players, coaches, and USOC officials regard him as such. There's a lot of footage of Kobe in this documentary, released only two and a half years after his death. These are the years after the rape allegations, but before his final two NBA championships, when he fully reclaimed, if not exceeded, his previous standing in the game. The Redeem Team, directed by John Weinbach, isn't all about Kobe. It's about Coach K and LeBron and Dwayne Wade and the Greek national team that started this cycle of American redemption, which I know probably put a big smile on Stefan's face. But the yes. star of this show <laughs> and the team is clearly Kobe. So, Vincent, what did you think of the documentary and the filmmaker's choice to center so much of it on Kobe? It definitely did double as a sort of Kobe Bryant hagiography. And I think part of it is, I would imagine, a result of the talk between the remaining players, the players who are still alive, because they did on some level venerate him. And it's easy to tell stories about someone you venerate who isn't there, right? So you, we get all these moments of uh, LeBron and D. Wade and Carlos Boozer, who's really good in this, and, and Chris Bosh, who also is good. Talking about Kobe, he he lent to these kinds of, you know, sure, they're true, but they're also kind of like mythic. They're tall tales about like, I'm going to run through Pau Gasol. I'm going to do that. So interestingly, though, the movie talks about as the whole redemption thing, the text of the movie says, oh, he's being redeemed from his conflict with Shaq or, you know, the the, the last two years or his request of being traded out of Los Angeles or, you know, the last two years of their record and stuff like that. It doesn't really make reference to um, Colorado. So there's a really interesting sort of play of presence and absence, things that are talked about, not talked about that I think carries through the rest of the movie, too, by the way. Yeah. And you're referring, of course, to the sexual assault case against right. Brian. Yes. And that was in 2003, so it was, and, and it didn't conclude until 2005 when he reached a settlement with the woman at the, uh, at the resort that accused him of sexual assault. So he was left off of the 2004 Olympic team for obvious reasons. For these reasons, yeah. um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, most of the other huge stars in the NBA didn't play on that team either. Jason Kidd, Shaq. Uh, Kevin Garnett, Tracy McGrady, they all said no. They all had played on the Olympic team before and had their gold medals. Um, and the 2004 team is the one that that sucked, the one that lost in the semifinals, <laughs> that was portrayed as petulant and selfish and disconnected and unmotivated. And so Kobe wasn't on the original cast of um, the original roster for the qualifiers for 2008. He was added the year before by Krzyzewski. So there's also, in addition to the redemption narrative of Kobe, both in the NBA and his personal life, there is the savior narrative that, hey, we were still good. They had, you know, they had LeBron and they had Dwayne Wade and they had Chris Bosh and they had everybody that they needed now. And Krzyzewski gets the buy-in from everybody, which we see a lot of in the documentary. But Kobe is sort of defined as the piece. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Bill Plasky, I think, says it really well. He said, this is the start of the second chapter of Kobe Bryant. And I'd never really thought about it 
because I thought maybe it was the championships that had sort of redeemed him in the eyes of so many people and the narrative around him, you know, had changed. But I mean, in truth, a lot of that had started because he pivoted to the Black Mamba uh, persona, right? Right. Um, it was just sort of a cynical play to be like, all right, well, if all you guys are going to hate me, I'm going to get tattoos and, you know, curse a lot more in my interviews. Um, you know, to, you know <laughs> if, if, I, if, I can't be, if I can't be Will Smith, um, I'm going to be something else totally different. And so, yeah, I think that was actually, though, one of the failures of the documentary to not talk about why bringing Kobe onto the U.S. team was a problem, like why he had baggage. Like it wasn't he told on Shaq. And demanded a trade. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of skirting the obvious here. But I did think that they did a really good job of showing how much of a loner he was. And like, so if you if you can separate those allegations, um, separate it out. And like the other reasons that Kobe was just sort of a strange character and sort of a lone wolf in a way. Um, they were really good at that. Like talking about, hey, we all went out and partied. Kobe's, you know, drenched in sweat in the hotel lobby at 430 in the morning. We knew he didn't have any friends, you know, all that sort of stuff. All those guys, you know, sort of reacting to him not being a, you know, not much of a talker. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a buddy picture in a way. Yeah, you know, they bring the Kobe in, and yes. we get and they turn him into funny, happy, joking Kobe, as opposed to the the loner that we that he is. Right, right. Yeah, he becomes more of. I mean, you and you guys tell me if you think this is wrong, but I think mm -hmm. through this process, he becomes more of a statesman, like the personable redeemed version that everyone became more familiar with before and after his death. Well, it like, humanizes him, right, Vincent? Right. Yeah, it yeah. humanizes him in a way. And, you know, in some ways we can think of both this and the uh, 38 at the Garden, the Jeremy Lin documentary we, we just talked about as like key examples of the new like player produced media that has become such a big um, conversation over the past, I don't know, five years, maybe the sort of new media, as Draymond Green calls it, like the Redeemed Team documentary is produced by LeBron, Wade, uh, Carmelo and Maverick Carter, uh, their business Maverick advisor. Carter. Right. So it's, it's the sort of product of the player empowerment era. Right. Um, and, and in a similar way that we kind of have these lacuna about Kobe and things that are not said. Similarly, like Tom Ziller in his newsletter that I, I get in my inbox every morning talks about how they also don't talk about the real controversy that it was in depth to hire Mike Krzyzewski. You know, this person who was a college coach and in some ways it's a it's an insult to NBA coaches that it's not Greg Popovich, it's not someone else who from the NBA ranks. And it also becomes, as was talked about more and more in the years after 2008, um, a way for Krzyzewski to burnish his reputation as a recruiter, right? I've coached LeBron James. I coached Kobe Bryant, right? And there are some uncomfortable moments that don't necessarily get digested in the way some other things do, like the fact that Krzyzewski is like bringing the military in um, and doing this whole like hero narrative and also like using the word classy a lot to be like, let's be classy. Let's. There's a lot of unspoken things about how he's coaching this team. So... Really interesting. But those are framed, Joel. But aren't those framed, Joel, as the reasons that this team succeeded and bonded and, you know, were patriotic right. and did it for the country? I'm so glad you guys brought that up because I was really uncomfortable with the positioning of Jerry Colangelo and Mike Krzyzewski as sort of the saviors of the Dream Team project. Like the subtext, as you mentioned, is that the American player is too selfish, too unskilled, right. too lacking in competitive spirit. Compared to win their own. particularly to the Argentinians and the Greeks and the French and the Italians and the Lithuanians. And, right. and Stefan, you mentioned, look at all the players that are not playing in the 2004 team. Like, it can't just be as simple as that we sent a not particularly talented team to go play against all these other teams that had an increasing number of NBA players and the cohesion that the American team did not have. With, I mean, look, with, man, with a coach that kind of didn't get it, Larry Brown. On that 2004 team, there was only one All-NBA selection, Tim Duncan. There were only two All-Stars, Tim Duncan and Allen Iverson. I kind of look at, like, post-2001 Allen Iverson, like uh, Eddie George, like after he carried the ball 400 carries right, one season. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's he's just not quite— it was a lot of miles on, on a little guy, right? And so that was not a particularly talented team. Emeka Okafor— was on that Olympic team, man. You know what I mean? And I'm not no, <laughs> no I'm not hating on Emeka, no, but no, it's true. But it's just he like was the why Christian it, Leitner of that team, though. Well, right, right. Fair point. Fair point. Iverson, Marbury, Young Wade, 
young Bron. Who barely played, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, it can be that the 2018 redeemed America's position in basketball in the world. But also, can it just be that that 2014 was just not really good, thrown together, and they got what they got? But it didn't have to be that Mike Krzyzewski and and Jerry Colangelo had to be the ones to come in and save these guys from themselves in American basketball culture. The the shifting narrative in 2004 is that the rest of the world is caught up and we just sent a bunch of guys out there and threw our jerseys on the court and expected to win. The reality was that they still probably should have won in 2004. You know, any collection of great NBA players should still probably win. If Tim Duncan is as great as they said he is, they, they should have won. But anyway, wow. that's another conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. But I mean, I think the Larry Brown factor does loom large. I have, yes. uh, I interviewed uh, Stefan Marbury a couple of years ago and he, uh, he was still mad about Larry Brown and, and the sort of what he construed as like sort of total paternalism and disrespect that Brown was dispensing that year. So there's, there are a lot of factors that go under uh, explored in that way. One thing that's interesting to me is I kind of got an alternate sort of genealogy of something else, which is the change of play in the NBA, right? Because in 08, we're still in the sort of like, low scoring. It's really not the NBA that we know today. Right. And interestingly, we see, you know, they're learning the FIBA rules, but also like if you watch the gameplay, Kobe, Melo, these guys are all taking a bunch of threes. Part of that is the, you know, the difference in the FIBA line and everything. But you see them adapting to a new style of play that back then was dubbed European and and now is sort of um, attributed to um, analytics, right? Mm-hmm. For some reason, those those two heuristics have sort of merged into one thing. But it's, it, it's interesting to see something, you know, we, we we talk about it as like Olympic mellow, right? Like taking a lot of corner threes, all these kind of things. Interesting to see the development of basketball through mm. this documentary as well, mm-hmm. like as a stylistically, strategically, et cetera. Yeah. Can it also be then too that, and I guess I, I hate to hammer on the coaches and the, the officials piece of this, but when they lost in 88, a lot of the complaint was that John Thompson was like over, not overly focused on defense, but he had an extremely offensively limited team and a young team as well, obviously, but a, a limited team. And they were playing that style of basketball, that, you know, that kind of became more common in basketball throughout the late 80s, early 90s, you know, in, through the 90s and the early 2000s. That def- defense first, you know, got to hammer people and goon it up. And Larry Brown comes out of that tradition as well. And that's like not, I mean, <laughs> Defense, yes, you do need to play really good defense to play to win at basketball. But against a really good offense, sometimes that shit doesn't matter. At this point, he's doing what he had to do to win. And like that 76ers team that he's coming off of, like that's not an extremely offensively talented team. Um, and in fact, if you look at the DNA of the Olympic basketball project, Greg Popovich was most recently the coach. They won the gold most recently, and but like they didn't dominate in the way that some of the other teams do. One of my favorite things... Uh, about this documentary was, you know, it's kind of like the sort of we're getting together, we're becoming a team montage. But the way they do that is to show the team going to watch other people play at the Olympics, mm, right? Because yeah. the the 04 team was uh, famously sort of almost stranded on this uh, Greek ocean liner because of the ongoing geopolitics at the time, the Iraq war, all these other things. These guys are like in the Olympic village and going to the cafeteria and going to see Michael Phelps and sort of and going to see gymnastics. They're going to yeah, see going everything. To, it's like the yeah. clips are great. <laughs> yes. Um, it's really cool. And it makes, I mean, it makes me think that even since then the idea of basketball as a, as a stage for international statementship with all the, all of the problems inherent in that framing, but also all of the, genuine sort of heartening aspects of that like have only grown since then that we think of our athletes like that much more now than we did even then absolutely don't don't you didn't you find it sort of just touching to see like young wade and young Braun and mellow you know making corny young boy jokes and stuff and you know like i just like you can see they're in their youth um and this like friendship is blossoming and we know i mean it's funny because the documentary didn't talk about sort of the consequence of bringing together a lot of those guys uh, and how much they enjoy mm-hmm. playing with each other, right. right? That's exactly right, Joe. This is before the banana boat weighed Bosch LeBron and probably influenced it. They did genuinely in all of this stuff and in the contemporaneous interviews seem really genuine about how, they, how much they enjoyed this experience, right? 
not in a sort of ham-handed or putting it on for the cameras kind of way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, did you all get kind of was struck by what Bron said a month before they get ready to go uh, to Beijing? And he's talking, he's addressing the team and he says, mm-hmm. you know, I've often thought if I had Carlos Boozer or Chris Paul on my team, I'd be a champion. But I don't have that excuse now. And I'm like, hmm, I'm, I'm exactly. sure you did commit that to memory about what it would be like to have <laughs> some of those guys <laughs> on your team, right? Yeah, it was this re- very good foreshadowing. And I mean, I, there have been reports. I mean, they've never been totally substantiated, but there have been reports that Le- that's when LeBron and and Wade and Bosch got together and like saw that they all were going to be free agents the same year and they actually talked about it mm. this summer. I am mostly convinced by that. Uh, you know, it's very funny that like you know the odd man out was uh, Mello, who was at the time on the Denver Nuggets and ends up being the sort of tragic hero of of uh, uh, the uh, sort of mid tens Knicks. And let's why don't we f- why don't we why don't we finish up by talking about the gold medal game? against Spain yeah. in those Olympics because that game really embodied a lot. You know, Kobe at one point says in the doc that there's beauty in the fact that the previous team lost because it meant that so many countries were playing at a high level. And I think he was talking about losing to Greece in the semifinals of the world championship in 2006. Um, and Coach K tells this story that at one point he told someone, you don't want to be having your grandkids sitting on your lap and you're saying, yeah, we lost to that fucking Greek team, which I did not appreciate. But that Spain <laughs> game didn't really, didn't really reflect like where basketball had come. I mean, that game was split at such a high level. Um, you know, a lot of Olympic Weren't games. Weren't you struck with how good it looked? Like, it looked like a really good game. I'd forgotten how yeah. good that game was until yeah. we watched it on documentary. Yeah. Most Olympic games, you know, the, the games aren't as long. The rules are fucked up. You know, you usually in the 80s, right? Or if it, the U.S. is playing, it's like 110 to 69. This final was 118 to 107. And it was just quality after quality. Pau Gasol, Rudy Fernandez. I mean, the Spanish players were really good. Yeah. All of my reservations and, like, we've discussed all my sort of moments of, like, doubts about the documentary. I, I was tearing up at the end. The yeah. game game footage and watching them and then and then moving from the game footage into the the getting of the the medals, the, the medals like it it just works, okay? At this kind of thing, it's it's undefeatable. You cannot defeat Dwayne Wade hitting a big shot and mean mugging down the court and music behind it. Like forget about it. I was I, it just like it works. No, yeah, and, it and just because works. I think it's legit, Joel. I think like the drama of that run was not, you know, not unreasonable to turn into a sort of dramatic sequence. I mean, <laughs> them talking about and, and Coach K playing up how great Ginobili is. Um, oh, and do you want to talk about Ginobili real quick? <laughs> oh boy, the last time I was on this podcast, we did a, a Ginobili thing, and and I, as I'm watching Ginobili? this, I, was, I yeah. brought that up for a reason. And Coach K, man, put the quotes on each player's chair about how. <laughs> I mean, Someone said that Manu is the second best shooter in the NBA, and someone said that Manu is the second best point guard in the world. How many Hall of Famers do you think Dwayne Wade would say about, I lost it, I'll give you Kobe, but I'm not giving you Manu? There's not a lot of <laughs> Hall of Famers that get talked about in that way. <laughs> rank, rank xenophobia. <laughs> <laughs> It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you'll owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster, all so you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval. Interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you may make before the end of the billing period. 
And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. For our After Ball name, Joel, I was going to look for a college teammate of Jeremy Lin's at Harvard, but Ooh. Josh covered that back in July when he mentioned Brian Cussworth, mm-hmm. who witnessed from the Warriors G League team bench Anthony Morrow's single-game G League scoring record of 47 points. Cussworth was a classmate of Pablo Torre's at Harvard, which means he was a senior when Jeremy Lin was a freshman. The circle of life is small. But instead, let's honor the first Asian-American and first non-white player in the NBA, Wat Misaka. He joined the Knicks in 1947, three years before Earl Lloyd became the first black player in the league. Misaka was a 5'7 point guard, defensive stalwart out of Utah, who in the NIT final in 1947 at the Garden held Kentucky's star guard Ralph Beard to just one point in a 45-40 upset win. Then, just three months after Jackie Robinson debuted in Brooklyn, Misaka was signed by the Knicks. He was released after scoring just seven points in three games, went home to Utah, and had a career as an engineer. Misaka wasn't recognized as an NBA pioneer for decades. He died in 2019, and his obit in the New York Times said that when Jeremy Lin was struggling with the Warriors before he was picked up by the Knicks, Misaka reached out to the rookie, quote, Jeremy Lin seemed like a good kid in a dark and gloomy time, Masaka told Sports Illustrated. I wrote him a note of encouragement and just told him to hang in there. Oh, that's really sweet of him. Yeah, I know. The connections, the connections, man. All right, Joel, what's your Wat Masaka? Yeah, so my Wat Masaka, you know, I was thinking about uh, last week when we were talking about Victor Wimbenyama, the seven foot four French phenom who will likely be the top pick in the next NBA draft. And I couldn't help but take note of all the great players who came up in comparison. You know, there was Kevin Durant, Dirk Nowitzki, Kristaps Porzingis, who's maybe not great, but you know, productive NBA player, Ralph Sampson, and so on and so on. And having seen Wimbenyama play, it's hard not to indulge in that kind of hype. He certainly seems to be the real deal. So then I wondered, how often do we crank up the hype machine and spit out the most daunting pro comparisons when talking about these teen stars? So as a guideline here, I used USA Today's list of the greatest high school basketball players of all time, which unfortunately excludes players overseas from consideration. So there's not going to be any Dirk or even Andrew Wiggins, who was called Maple Jordan once upon a time, believe it or not, or Darko on this list. Um, It's all homegrown products going back more than a half a century. So let's start in Philadelphia in 1958, where the Inquirer wrote a profile about an especially promising nearly seven-foot sophomore with this headline. Chamberlain, 6'11", a junior grade Bevo, scourge of public league at Overbrook. Though there was an unfortunate line in the story that read, 202-pound Chamberlain, who bears a strong facial resemblance to movie land step and fetch it, but of course steps much livelier. This is in the daily newspaper. (laughs) Oh my my God. (laughs) They called him the, quote, biggest bundle to ever play in the public conference and quote, the best we've ever developed in the city. Theirs is a muted enthusiasm, if only because it's 1958, probably not much in the way of precedent for Wilt or what's possible. I couldn't find a good comparison, just stories about his athletic exploits and dominating the local competition. But that changed inside of a few years. In February 15th, 1963's edition of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, the newspaper profiled a sophomore named Lou Alcindor. Here's what they wrote. Even Bill Russell, Bob Pettit, George Mikan, and Wilt Chamberlain were never as big as Al Sindor's kids. Every NBA coach is already aware of, quote, Leaping Louie, who arrived as a celebrity the day teammates affectionately nicknamed him the Big A. The Democrat and Chronicle of Rochester said in April of that year that Al Sindor was, quote, another Wilt Chamberlain, only better. Hmm, not, not wrong. It kind of turned out to be right there. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Lou went to UCLA and put together one of, if not the most dominant college careers before moving on to the NBA. He was succeeded in Westwood by Bill Walton, a redheaded six foot, ten and a half center from just outside of San Diego. In a March 1970 profile in the LA Times, the San Diego State's men coach said of Walton that 
he was the best high school player I've ever seen and, quote, like Alcindor, and he's probably a better shot blocker at this stage than Alcindor was. Again, very high praise, not necessarily wrong. But a few years later, across the country in Virginia, Sports Illustrated wrote a short profile on senior almost seven-footer Moses Malone, skipping right over Bill Walton, as I called Malone, the most sought-after high school basketball prospect since Lou Alcindor. Malone later caused a stir by signing with the Utah Stars of the American Basketball Association, becoming the first player in modern history to enter professional basketball right out of high school. The next guy up is going to be somebody that you're probably going to be a little surprised to hear. There was a guy named Billy James Cartwright, Letter and much better known as Bill Cartwright. He starred at Elk Grove High School just outside of Sacramento. And a writer for the Berkeley Gazette wrote in January 1975 that a well-known Midwest scout who watched the development of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Walton, and later Moses Malone flatly rates Cartwright better than the three at a comparable age. He has better moves than Malone right now, someone told the writer. Another said... I can't remember any prospect who is as talented as he is. And, of course, that's Bill Cartwright, uh, who later was a center of some renown with the Chicago Bulls. Um, But four years later, back in Virginia, it was Ralph Sampson who had emerged as the latest best big schoolboy prospect ever. At seven foot three and a little more than 200 pounds, hardly anyone had seen a basketball player like Sampson. But the Associated Press guessed that Sampson would have been a top 10 NBA draft pick out of high school. The AP wrote, Sampson has been called one of the greatest high school players ever developed in Virginia, possibly as good as Moses Malone. So there's a little bit of, you know, reticence there and no comparison to the former Lou Alcindor. Patrick Ewing was up next, a seven-foot Jamaican native who moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts in junior high school. By 1981, the Akron Beacon Journal was predicting big things for him. Every now and then, there is one of them in high school basketball, a large athlete whose talent seems to be singular. In years gone by, there were Wilt Chamberlain and Lou Alcindor and Bill Walton and Ralph Sampson. Now, there is Patrick Ewing. Get me that tube off. He's in pretty nope. good, right? Yeah, all right. And what is it about Virginia? Because by the mid-80s, another superstar center emerged from the Commonwealth. Alonzo Mourning. Sports Illustrated called the six foot ten Mourning the best player in his class. And the Richmond Times Dispatch reached back into history and over a handful of former Virginia greats for what it considered the most apt comparison. They wrote, Some are boldly calling him the best prep big man since Kareem Abdul Jabbar was Liu Alcindor. Mm-hmm. All right. A year later came perhaps the biggest of the big boys, Shaquille O'Neal out of San Antonio. By the time he was set to enroll at LSU for his freshman year in 1989, observers had finally found a novel comparison. A writer for the Tennessean and putting together his SEC preview wrote that Shaq was seven foot one and 286 pounds of warrior, a remarkable athlete whose size and mobility are reminiscent of Akeem Olajuwon. More than a decade later, near the end of Shaq's prime, emerged an unusually buff high school post player out of Atlanta by the name of Dwight Howard. In 2004, days before the NBA draft, the Hartford Current quoted him as saying, teams want the next KG, as in Kevin Garnett. You're looking at him. The Current followed up. The comparison to Kevin Garnett isn't his fault. As scouts became enamored with the winner of the 2004 Naismith Award as the nation's top high school player, they called him the next KG, or the next Tim Duncan. Again, Dwight Howard probably will end his career in the Hall of Fame. Uh, No Lou Alcindor comparison, but that's fine. And the final center to make USA Today's list is a player who, today, is probably better known as the one chosen ahead of Kevin Durant in the 2007 NBA draft. Greg Oden... At an even seven feet, teamed with point guard Mike Conley to win three state championships at their Indianapolis area high school. One coach, a man who seems to know his history, reached all the way back into the past when trying to find the right comparison for Odin. I compared Odin to what we faced when I was at Purdue and when we played UCLA when they had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. All right. So no Lou, no Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, an updated enough comparison. But before we wrap things up, I just want to let me add my own contribution to the hype machine from 20 years ago when I was a cub reporter at the Associated Press. I drove down to Beaumont, Texas in late winter to profile a six foot 11, 260 pound 17 year old who was making easy work of the competition. 
His name was Kendrick Perkins. And look, I, I have to admit, I was either echoing hype I'd already heard. It was just sort of taken aback by how big he was. But yes, I quoted someone in the story as saying this. I think he's the best player to come out of Texas since Shaq. In fact, one recruiting analyst told me he's fundamentally better than Shaq was entering his senior year. Uh, I, I profiled Perkins again a year later, months before the NBA draft, when he was trying to decide between going pro or going to the University of Memphis. And Shaq came up again. The same recruiting analyst told me, He's got a better shooting touch than Shaquille O'Neal had when he was in high school. Shaq was strictly a power player, while Kendrick has got a pretty nice touch. Maybe, you know, he didn't think to come up with Lou Alcindor, who had, you know, really good touch. But there you have it. Kendrick Perkins and Shaq. Proof that, hey, we can all take things a little too far. I don't know. I mean, if you're looking at Perk versus, say, George Mikan... Maybe that was a better comparison. <laughs> right, that could have gone right, yeah. You Bob know? Pettit. I didn't see Bob Pettit Bob play, Pettit. but that seems like that could have been a, Hard to an apt one. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. yeah. In my contribution to this field, I can't get the story because it's under lock and I don't subscribe to the Wall Street Journal these days. Um, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I did a piece. I did a front page story about how the NBA was looking overseas and recruiting mm -hmm. more foreigners, mm -hmm. uh, more Europeans. I did a profile of a guy named Maciek Lampe. Oh seven footer out of Poland who ended up getting picked 30th by the Knicks and did not uh, compare mm. to, to Patrick Ewing in any way, alas. Though his agent later would find and sign Giannis. Okay, well, that, look, they came along finally with it. But uh, you, you, you didn't look at Lampe and say, that looks like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, nothing like that. I hope I didn't say that in the piece. I'm pretty <laughs> certain that I did not. <laughs> I did hang out with Lampe when he was picking suits for the draft. He ended up getting taken 30th by the Knicks. No, yeah, it's not bad. I mean, I mean, it sounds very Frederick Weiss of him, by the way. Just guy, the tall guy didn't work out. But hey, look, he got his moment in the sun. Thanks for contributing to his hype. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe, go to slate.com slash hangup. And you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And please subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and join Slate Plus. For Joel Anderson and Vincent Cunningham, I'm Stefan Fatsis. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.